me welcome Steve Little. <laughs> All right, so Steve, um, we did not have a chance to do the sexy green room before this. So why don't we just start off and do that right now and just talk about you know, your, your background. So your bio talks about how you started, you started your first business when you were pretty young, right? Thirteen. Yeah. Thirteen. And you sold it, mm -hmm. right? So let's talk a little bit about that, that yeah. first business that thing went. Well, I was telling some of the folks earlier, I started my first business when I was 13. It was in lawn care. I started like a lot of kids. I was cutting lawns for about 10 days. And I realized this sucks. <laughs> lawns. I didn't like it. You know, but it was a way to make some money. Uh, and it didn't take me long to figure out that, well, I mean, I can charge more for the lawn and get somebody else to stand me on the lawn more. I don't make as much money, but I can get a lot more lawns. So I started building it that way. And I got to a point where I had pretty much everything in the neighborhood I could reach with my bicycle. And um, I noticed one Saturday that I spent my whole weekend going from door to door, basically reselling every job. I did it last week. You know, hey, Mr. Jones, I'm going to come back next week. And at the end of the summer, I noticed that I started to hear, well, now I give it an extra week. It's not growing that fast. So I was walking down the driveway one day, and I realized that this is costing me a lot of money. Hmm. I mean, I've gone from every week to every other week, sometimes every three weeks. You know, this is hard. I don't like doing hard stuff. I like doing easy stuff. So I came up with the idea of a semi-annual and an annual contract. I went back through the next week and told people I had a new idea sign up at a flat monthly rate, you take care of their lawn, you take care of their snow, you take care of the sticks and the mm -hmm. leaves, and, you, know, you just basically take care of the outside of the place. And almost everybody took that. I mean, there were you know, one or two people who didn't. Some people didn't want a year, they wanted a half a year, some wanted a quarter. So, you know, we made adjustments and accommodations. And, um, you know, so that's ended up being pretty successful. And it also allowed me a lot more time to get more clients. So you know, I could hire a lot more laborers because mm -hmm. I could have I had a predictable business model, mm -hmm. see what was coming, right? And the billing was automatic. So I could go out and hire people. I didn't have to worry about having a whole bunch of people standing around in my desk front yard waiting for work. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, so that grew, did real well. And then my dad came home one day and said, uh, I've been transferred, we're moving. I said, but dad, what am I gonna do with my lawn care business? Now, I have to understand, he wasn't involved. He didn't realize that I had an entire warehouse full of equipment. He <laughs> thought I was out there pushing his snapper mower everywhere. <laughs> he said, well, what do you mean? So I just have to tell him you can't cut the grass anymore. I said, no, nah, Dad, I don't think you understand. So I pulled out the books, and I showed it to him. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe you've been doing this. This is incredible. You're making more money than I can. No. <laughs> That's not true. But anyway, so, you know, so he said, well, I don't know. What, do you, what should you do? He was an engineer, so he didn't mm -hmm. I said, well, I think we should sell it. I mean, somebody will buy it. There's all these contracts. And I think it was saying to the small group earlier that that was really the key for me. Um, while I didn't realize what to call it at the time, what I realized was that the real value of that business was in that book of contracts. Okay? It wasn't the equipment. It wasn't the labor. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't even the revenue. I think one of the fellows mentioned revenue. It really wasn't. Um, the companies that were interested in buying it didn't really care what it made because they could do a hundred times that right. in volume with the list of clients that I had in that book. And that's why it was so attractive. Yeah. So one Saturday, about two months before we moved, I made my dad drive me to one of the big local lawn care shops. I made an appointment with the business owner and went in with my, had a big binder, you know, anybody in high school have or grade school have the had the blue cloth cover, right? And I wrote on there, Magic Marker, yeah, right. my big book of business. So, <laughs> and I went in there and slapped this book down and flipped through it with the guys, and their eyes just popped out of their hands. Like, oh, God. You know, this is like pure gold right here. Um, so I had a guy who offered me about $185,000 for the business. And, you know, I said, well, that's pretty good. As <laughs> 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 we were leaving, my dad said, okay, well, congratulations. And that's amazing. I said, oh, no, we got to go to the next guy. Well, I'm not stopping with this one. Wow. Right? We ended up selling it for a little over $220,000. Wow. When I was 15 How old were you? years old. 15. 15. And then my dad said, you make more money than I <laughs> <laughs> That's the story. So, um, 
So to take us out from there then, so uh, um, you went to, I think you went to Richmond, right? University of Richmond. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah why did you even go to college? I mean, if all of a sudden you're, you're yeah. <laughs> that's a good question, right? I mean. It is a good question. It was a have to do in my family. Right. There's no options. Um, yeah, it was just sort of, we were brought up that, you know, this is what you do. Right? Mm -hmm. And the deal that my family had made is you go for a minimum of two years, and if you get through that and don't want to do it, then quit. Mm -hmm. But you have to go for at least two years. And I think that was smart. Um, but, you know, during those two years, I started a lot of different businesses. I don't know that there were not so much businesses as money-making schemes, but, you know, I made a lot of money, so it was good. <laughs> One of the ones that people like is, uh, I was walking, so the, I don't know if you know the university campus, but I was walking from my dorm to the Robbins Center for a big event. And um, as you'll get a common theme, I didn't like walking and there was a beer truck going there. So I hopped up on the foothold of the beer truck and was talking to the driver and found out that nobody had the distribution rights for the fraternities. Hmm. So I got it. And so I ended up being the beer distributor wow. for all the fraternity events on campus, which made me really popular. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that I could sell the same beer truck three times in one night. That was hmm. good. That was a good money maker. Wow. And so, what? Uh, can you just? Why don't you just keep going? I mean, tell us your entrepreneurial story before I stop you and know more about this. I mean, because so I did a bunch of little stuff like that. You know, just always looking for ways that I'd see something and go, well, I think money doing that. Yeah. And we could, I could get some people to do that. We could make some money. Just a lot of little things like that. And then um, I actually did quit school. After because I had started a cabinet company, which had grown into a, a Class B general contracting firm. And I got a uh, exclusive contract with British Petroleum. Uh, I'm going to really date myself. This was back when gas stations were going to be. Hmm. You know, when it used to be, it was a real gas station. They weren't, you, know, you couldn't go and buy chips and water and stuff. Right. And um, <coughs> British Petroleum was renovating all of their gas stations on the eastern seaboard. We got the contract, so I didn't have time for school. <laughs> so we just started doing that. How would you get the deal? Well, uh, I had built a company. We had about 35 employees. I was still going to school. Um, I had negotiated exclusive deals with Virginia Commonwealth University, uh, the ABC board. I renovated all the ABC stores in Richmond. You know, so we had some exposure to this kind of light commercial work. Yeah. Um, Earned a good reputation, had a good crew. So wow. in a bit, you know, I mean it's pretty straightforward. So keep going there. So you so you had the you had the cabinet making business that would turn into a you said a class B yeah. general contractor. Yeah, what happened there was, you know, I was, I was making cabinets and then I got some restaurant deals, so we went from cabinets to fixtures, a couple of law firms, you know, Putnam Williams, you might know that firm. Pretty big firm down there and we, you know, the executive suites wanted all of them. Good jobs, right? yeah, and lots of exposure because those guys start sharing names, and next thing I know, I'm doing restaurants. Right? Where you ever been to? A, you know, all the fixtures, the counters, the right. tables, all that. You have to make somebody has to make all that stuff. So we had, you know, pretty big factory cranking out this stuff, and uh, one day I got a job to do a fire renovation uh, for a general contractor, and he liked my work so much, he came to me and said, "Okay, I'll tell you what." You do all of my cabinetry, and I'll teach you everything there is to know about being a general contractor. To which I said, okay, that sounds good. Uh, we did that for a while, and then he had a massive heart attack. He died, huh. and his sons didn't want the business, and he had left the business to me. So that's how I ended up with the general contractor. Wow, all right, so how long, how long did you keep that? Not long. Um, I kept it running for a little less, a little bit. 27 months, something like that. Okay. Um, it's a funny story. I, I sort of had designs on becoming um, the next Hyman Construction. Does that mean anybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hyman and Omni. At that time in Richmond, if you drove down Broad Street, you had on one side of the street, uh, we had the uh, VCU tower was going up. The other side was the MCB tower. And Hyman had one and Omni had the other. And I was driving down looking at their banners. And I decided I was going to be one of them. Yeah. So I picked Hyman. Then I called Hyman Construction. I asked to speak to Mr. Hyman. There is no Mr. Hyman. <laughs> 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 they were 
were so taken by my request that somebody <laughs> took pity on me and said they'd meet me for lunch. Um, so I, I met the guy for lunch on Broad Street in a cafe outside. Of course, I walk up, you know, I just left the job site, yeah. so I'm covered with dust and, you know, yeah. a construction work. And uh, he walked up in a three piece suit. And he sat down and he said, hey, I don't really know why I'm here. Somebody told me that, you know, I was supposed to meet you. So what do you want to talk about? I said, well, I want to talk about how I make my company like your company. And the lesson I'd learned years ago is if you want to know how to do something, ask someone who's doing it. Right. Because they'll probably tell you. Uh, so I went through that story. And he sat there in complete and utter disbelief. So you had one of the top executives in Hyman Construction sitting there at the table looking at me like, what? <laughs> Are you out of your mind? He finally said to me, look, I don't want to burst your bubble. And he goes, I got to tell you, I've never had a meeting like this in my life. This is insane. You got a lot going for you. But I have to tell you this. I've been at Hyman for 15 years. Not one person in the executive office suite has ever punched a nail uh. in their life. So you're probably not on the course that's going to get you to Hyman. Here's the problem. I believe them. Huh. I shouldn't have believed uh -huh. I probably would be hiring. I probably would have built this mall. Yeah. Um, but for some reason, what he said tripped me up. And it caused me to begin to doubt whether or not I could actually accomplish that. Yeah. Um, the long story short of that is I ended up winding down the construction company completely, pulled it back to just myself and a helper, and then I went back to college. So you didn't even sell it? Just uh, went down. Wow, you went back to college. All right. And so, uh, how old were you then around this time? Well, Twenty-two. Wow. So, <laughs> all right. So you graduate from. I'm old. <laughs> yeah, right. So you graduate from Richmond, and just kind of take us through some of the other, maybe some of the high notes of the rest of the journey. Yeah. There. Well, I got out of Richmond. <coughs> and I actually came back up here. I worked for GT SpaceNet for about three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> And I really hated the office. <laughs> hated everything about being in the office. It was not a good situation for me. Um, so I started doing some other stuff. Mm. You know, did a little bit more construction, but I really had sort of, you know, bent my pick on that. I didn't want to do that anymore. Um, <coughs> ended up working for a small tech firm here. Um, this was pre-Ethernet, if anyone can imagine, life before there were things called Ethernet, let alone the Internet. And... Um, I don't know, back then, offices had like a mini computer and terminals. Right. And getting chan communication channels to the terminals was a problem. So a company had invented a IBM 3380-like terminal server for those mini computers. I was pretty enamored with that technologically. I thought it was a pretty cool idea. I got a job working for them as a sales engineer. Excuse me, that was my first bite at the startup Apple. And, uh, you know, I eventually negotiated a path to the corporate office, ended up in a senior executive position, and took that company out. And that was the end of that. And that was just, you know, one software startup after another. And so that, and so that was the journey that took you up to, we, pretty much that same journey took you up to the zero limits, would you say? I mean, yeah, so then I did, um, so what happened there is we had a lot of success, excuse me, had a lot of success with that company. Then I went from there into a, a, uh, a standards-based network management protocol. I was one of the few people in the world who understood this thing called SNMP. Um, it was a fortuitous story. I was sitting on an airplane on my way to Tennessee, and I was listening to guys sitting on either side of me. It turns out one of them was Marshall Rose, the other one was Jeff Case, for those who don't know. These are the two guys that invented the SNMP management mm -hmm. protocol, which means nothing to anybody in the room, except it's the protocol that's used to manage every network device on the planet at this point. <laughs> and these guys were talking about this protocol. I thought it was pretty interesting. And I happen to know a lot of the people in that community, and like companies like Bridge and 3Com, mm -hmm. because of my connections with this startup. I said, well, I can get that microcode put on all those devices. You know, they thought I was kidding, but I wasn't. And so, you know, I said, you know, I'll tell you what, you give me the microcode and give me a month 
And if I don't have every major hardware manufacturer embedding that microcode, then you don't have to pay me any. Otherwise, you pay me royalties. You have no upfront cash. So they figured, why not? Right? We, um, about three weeks, we had Synoptic, Cabletron, Cisco, Wellfleet, Bridge, 3 um, pretty much everybody wanted mm -hmm. this microcode, mm -hmm. as I suspected they would. Now, here's the cool thing, is once the microcode's there, it's, in and of itself, it's not doing anything other than gathering data and storing the data on the device. So I went back to the Valley, got a bunch of software engineers together to write software that would go get the data and present the data in a console. Yeah. And that was the first, to my knowledge, the first SMP-based network management system in the world. Oh, wow. Right. And uh, we just drew strip charts and it was basically useless information, but <laughs> you know, made people feel like they were doing something with all this stuff they were buying. Yeah. And then one thing led to another. We just kept going up the stack. We built six companies all on the same stack of information. We started with network devices, then added system devices, and then applications, and so on. And so every company, we just followed the same formula. So what got you out of doing that and into the, the advisory work that you do now? Not money. <laughs> I mean, we had a lot of success. You know, yeah. What I discerned was, okay, I'd, I'd done six companies, uh, all of which we had managed through acquisitions, all of which were north of 100 to $150 million. So mm -hmm. I'd earned a really solid reputation in the Valley. Um, most of the top, top tier VC firms would bring me into any project and uh, pay me a lot of money to advise them on what they should do or not do. Um, funny story. Because um, years later, I'd been retired, and one of the investors who I made something like $150 million for over the years uh, was in town, and we went to dinner and uh, had a nice dinner. I was joking around with him. I said, Dewey, I never figured out how did you guys decide which ones to go with? <laughs> he laughed. He goes, This is the easiest thing in the world. And we'd offer it to you. If you wouldn't take it, we weren't putting any more money in. No. If you'd got in, we'd give you all the money you needed. Uh. So we had a lot of success with that. And so when it ended, um, I retired. Didn't really do very much. I did what you, what you would think a guy my age would do. Yeah. Like nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, actually I did. I got myself back in physical shape. I put on what I described as 100 pounds of executive board body fat. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't right. So, uh, That's the part I'm working on now. Yeah. Yeah. So I was always going to Japan and my doctor Okay, so for you, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. I would prefer you have your heart attack here in the States. Yeah. Right, so out of the way to the So I took some time, got back in shape, and just sort of reconnected with my family. I hadn't actually spent any time with my kids at that time. Yeah. I was 90 plus percent travel right. through almost 12 years. Uh, I commuted from here to the valley for 12 years. Jeez. Every then week. I moved there. <laughs> yeah. right? But. Um, you know, so one day, uh, well, you know, over time, I would just start, you know, business owners would ask for advice, and I'd offer them advice, and, you know, then I started charging them money for advice. And, um, I noticed some really interesting things. Um, I mentioned these at lunch. Um, in the course of conversation, there were two topics that, that I always brought up in one way or another, one of which was, what is the exit strategy? And I was stunned at how few business owners have a legitimate exit strategy. Um, the answers I would get were sort of like, we don't have one, which is at least honest. Um, the other one was often something like, we're going to grow it and someone's going to buy it. You know, to which I said, that's cool, but not a strategy. Right? Yeah. Um, and you know, there are some things around having that exit strategy that really matter in business. I, what I like to tell people is an exit strategy is more about the strategy than it is the exit. And if you think about it this way, without a strategic exit plan, without knowing what is the value, what's contributing to the value of your business, it's not always revenue, it's not always earnings, it's not always customers. Right? And if you doubt that, then it tell me why Zappos Instagram <laughs> sold for $3 billion. Yeah. Okay? It's not always the case. Uh, for instance, I was telling the story at lunch. We had a trucking company recently. Yeah. Can I jump ahead? Yeah, it's a good story. Yeah, go um, for it. Yeah. 
you know, two guys built the trucking company, that been in it a while, just doing about 28 million in revenue, just had a multiplier of something like 0.9, mm -hmm. really bad. <laughs> uh, they were pretty disappointed, they you know, thrown themselves into this thing for about 10 years, and when we ran the valuation, like many clients, they thought, oh my gosh, it's not even worth a year worth of revenue, I mean, it's worth nothing. So they called us and asked us to work with them. Uh, we did an assessment and we found two interesting leverage points. So one of the things we do for clients is we, dig, we do a deep dive on the company and we're looking for ways that we can either pivot or reinvigorate the company to restart the value growth curve. Right? There's a curve that all companies have. Every company has the same shaped curve. It's, you know, it can be squished up and steep or it can be stretched out shallow, but it's always the same curve. You get fast value growth, so it's a rate of change in value. So the rate of change in value goes up quickly in the beginning, and then it levels off, and then the rate of change dips, and then it starts to climb slowly again. Right? It's always that same shape. And once you get over on the other side of it, um, your value is now determined by the market. You're no longer driving the value of your company, and that's not a good place to be but that's where most business owners end up. So 90% of the companies that work with us start with, we want to sell our company, what's it worth? Well, that's the wrong question to ask, <coughs> because that's saying you're gonna let the market determine what your company's worth. I like to say, what do you want for it, <laughs> right? Because that's what we're gonna have to build, mm -hmm. is a something that's worth that. Okay? And so that's what we do. We did that for this company, we found two really interesting things, they had built um, some very interesting software which helped them with, uh, in terms of a logistical advantage in their local market. It was worth something. Right? And we actually played with the idea of shifting them into a sort of a software licensing company, software as a service business model, you know, move, go to a software multiplier, which would then, you know, more like 12, not 0.9. Um, but the reality was, I was sitting there reviewing the report with my partner, and something didn't feel right. And I finally said, you know, let's just be honest, these two guys are trying to drive. The chances of them pulling this off are very, very small. I mean, they know nothing about building software companies, managing software people. You know, this is ridiculous. These guys manage trucks. <laughs> so not a good plan. So we went back and fixed my um, We also discovered that about 85% of their payload was energy related, about 15% wasn't. Thought that was pretty interesting. We ended up shifting the brand. We did nothing else significant inside the company. Some minor changes. But the big changes were we changed the color of their trucks from green to white. We changed the logo from Moxon Trucking to Moxon Energy Logistics. We dumped the 15% of the payload that was unrelated to energy, replaced it with energy related payload, and made them an energy logistics company, which has a seven times multiple. 0.9 to 7, we did all in seven months, sold the company for $68,000. And the owner of that company, young guy, literally did handsprings down the hall. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you know, it's finding, really what, what it's all about is finding what's creating value. What are the things that create value in the business? And it's not usually the things you're looking at. So, um, I have observed that, um, you probably found this out too, that there's a, a there are people, there are, there are business owners who get it, and there are business, uh, business owners who don't. In other words, the ones, you, you said, you have the guys who say, what's your exit strategy? I said, uh, I don't know what it is. And a lot of times, they don't even really care about it, because what they're thinking is that they're just gonna work it for the rest of their lives, they're never gonna get sick, then uh, mother will never go in the hospital, you know, nothing, nothing will ever break down. And yeah. so as a result of that, they're just gonna keep running it until they turn 85 years old, and. Yeah die in their bed and the business will dissolve, right? right? So, um, really <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. Uh, so, um, how are you, uh, well first, are you able to convince anybody, like this is the purpose of, it's one of the reasons we have this event here today, to convince business owners of the exit. It's always one of the ones I think, one of the things I try to get out of this event today is sure. the idea that there's always an exit, right? Uh, right? None of us is Superman. So, are you able to uh, change hearts and minds about exit, or do you have to just wait till somebody's ready to, to engage you. Well, is, there any, is there any educational component of what yeah, you do? Definitely. 
Um, so I might have thought otherwise until recently. I mean, so part of my answer would be would have been, I don't really care if you're not ready. Then you're not ready. I can't help you. Yeah. Um, but I'm not sure that's actually accurate. I think that um, one of the things that I've seen, I was again describing at lunch, is that there's a presentation I give about once a quarter. You saw it. That's yeah. where we met. Um, and there are two particular slides in this presentation that seem to have a really interesting effect on people. It basically scares the you know what out because they all of a sudden realize they are not ready for mm -hmm. the inevitable. And they have the realization that there is going to be an exit. One way or the other, way you know, if you keel over dead on your desk, you're going to exit. I mean, there will be an exit. And you need to know what's going to happen when that happens. Why, whatever the exit is, it's better to plan for it and design it than, you know, keel over dead on your desk. Right. Like that. But, um, so I think that um, what happens with business owners in particular is, um, particularly those that are in the executive leadership role, they get so myopically focused on you know, a few metrics that they never step out and really look at the big picture and realize you know, where are they in the time horizon of maturity for the business. And that you, know, you have to look there, otherwise you really have, you have a job. Yeah, can you, I don't know if you can do this, but can you uh, give a, an example of that, maybe an anecdote or something about how uh, you help somebody because uh, that might be useful for people in the video, or people in the room, or just mm -hmm. clients you work with, and so forth, where they were, they were they were so myopically stuck on a set of metrics, maybe what those metrics were, for example, and how you helped change that around. I mean, so preach on, brother. I mean, what's a, what, what can you tell? What can you tell us about that? Well, I don't know so much about the metrics, but I mean, I so um, I have a, uh, a a community of business owners that we work with online. Um, sort of a marketplace for sort of. And within that marketplace, there's a lot of people looking for advisory work around exit strategy and so forth. Many of them are approaching uh, their business from the posture of funding. And what I find is that a lot of business owners that are looking for money aren't thinking in terms of the exit. Mm -hmm. right? So whether it's startup money or growth money, it doesn't really make any difference. They're, they're really not looking at the value of that money correctly, mm -hmm. right? And so what ends up happening is, you know, they're, they're seeing a problem, right? We want to we grow faster. Right. In order to grow faster, we need money. Let's go raise money. Okay, but what's the return on faster growth? What are you talking about? Well, what I'm talking about is, is it worth growing faster, right? right? Because it may not be. It may be worth selling now. Right? Because fast growth may not, in fact, give you a significant effect. Company right here, I can't use their name, unfortunately, I apologize, but it was a custom home builder. Mm -hmm. a terribly fascinating kind of business, but they had a great reputation. Very, very high-end homes. You know, I mean, their clientele was the top of the top, so to speak. Um, and they came to realize that their business was worth uh, five million. And that even if they doubled everything, it'd be worth 5.5, right? Right. It, it, it marginal return on any growth beyond this point, which was nowhere near what they expected, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it was, th you know, we helped them come to the realization that just adding more growth wasn't going to change their valuation profile significantly at all. They needed to shift into a much more aggressive posture of the market changed their industry. Long story short, um, they're 90% through with a pivot we put them on, shifting them to um, small volume assisted living centers mm -hmm. that are marketed in a fractional, so super high valuation. Right? Their valuation is well over 50%. Wow. No, I don't want to make this uh, the entire rest of the day to be a marketing pitch for you, but I don't think I can help it. So what are some typical examples of ways that you uh, go into a company? And um, what the thing I'm really trying to find here, uh, just again in terms of the audience, is what are some things that you 
constantly find yourself having to change? What are some, some typical, whether mindsets or behaviors or just leadership issues and so forth? We need to talk a little bit about that. Some kind of typical things that you wind up having to attack when you get into a company. Yeah, I think the, so the first <coughs> one is, um, particularly in um, managed leadership, executive leadership in particular, is um, the appreciation or the recognition that the executive may be the limiting factor, mm -hmm. um, which is often the case. I mean, so if you just scroll back a few years when I was doing a lot of the startups I did, some of them were my startups. Many of them weren't. I was the second guy in. The first guy in had to go, right? Now, he did a good job mm -hmm. getting it to where it was, but he was not the guy who was getting it to where it needed to be, right? right? And this is something that they're particularly good at in the Valley. Um, it's somewhat bloody, yeah. you know, because yeah. a lot of times that guy's not treated real well. Yeah. But I would try to get in early enough that we could, you know, give him a good home and give him a good package, and yeah. give him a job to do or something like that. Yeah. That makes sense. But what I learned from that is, okay, this is not unusual at all. It's actually sort of the rule. And if the executive running the business doesn't realize that he can outgrow his own capacity to succeed, then somebody needs to help him understand that. Yeah. Right. And as soon as they get that and are willing, you know, whether it's ego or whatever other personal best thing he has in it, if you'll let go of it and just ride it, it's much more fun, right? Right. I mean, you know, I've, I've, I've told you guys several times already, I don't like hard work. <laughs> I'd be the first to admit I'm the laziest guy in the library. You know, I yeah. just, I don't see any point in it. I think there's a lot of other people who like it. So let me ask you about that really quick. You know, so I, I heard an interview with Ted, Ted Leonsis once, and what he said specifically was that uh, he is going to try and investments he makes to hold on to an entrepreneur, I, I am paraphrasing by the way, mm -hmm. as long as possible because you know, he was the passion behind the business and if he loses that passion, that's the thing he's concerned about, but the company growing. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, it can be, yeah, it's absolutely true if, if he doesn't become, you know, a roadblock. A, a detrimental force. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I've seen it both ways. I've seen guys, you know, take that role and be happy. Um, actually, a lot of them are happier. Yeah. eBay is a great example of that, right? Uh, great example of that. Pierre Omidar, did yeah. I say his name? Yeah. yeah. I think just they're better off in the better role for them. Right? Yeah. Um, and I've seen others where, you know, it was just a constant battle of undermining and all kinds of other things that end up just destroying the company. So you eventually have to get rid of the guy anyway. Yeah. But yeah, I tend to agree. You want to preserve the, the minds and the passion and the, the, the identity. We were talking about brand a little while ago. I mean, there is a brand component. Yeah. Um, whether or not it's leverage or it's something else entirely. So what are some other things? So we talked about executive uh, so, leadership. So that's a big one. The other one I think we run into a lot is um, uh, really understanding, as I mentioned, what's driving value be amazed at how many business owners have no concept of what's driving kind of value. They believe that it's revenue, earnings, customers, you know, customer relations. Now those are important things, don't get me wrong. Right. They're part of every good business, that's a fact. But they're not necessarily the thing driving value. Um, and really zeroing in on what drives value is the key. You really put the thumb screws on someone about that and you'll find out they don't they finally admit they don't know how mm -hmm. to figure out what's driving value. Um, they don't know where to start looking. So how can they start looking? I mean, is it basically something where they're going to have to have external advisors to get them out of the uh, myopia, if you will, or? Well, external advisors help because they can be anonymous. So the, the short answer to the question uh -huh. is, well, how would you find, if you had a product to sell, and you wanted to find out who was going to buy it and why, Right, what they would pay for it, like that. Yeah. When everybody has products, you have to know that, right? Otherwise, it's pretty hard to sell your product. Agreed? Right. Well, how do you do it? Everybody's done it. You go ask, right? Yeah. You put it out in front of customers, you say, so I got this thing. We buy it. This is the problem it's solved. <coughs> you have that problem? Yeah. Would you like to solve that problem with this? I don't know. How much does it cost? That's the, that's the conversation. Well, that's really the same conversation you're going to have about the business. The difference is what's being sold. And this is a key difference, I don't want to market here, but, but our view is that businesses are sold, not bought. And that's the key 
key difference. A company that's bought is being driven by the market, right? People are paying what they're gonna pay, and you're sort of drifting through that. You're gonna get what you're gonna get. You hope it's enough, right? Where we view it as, no, no, you wanna sell your business, you package it for sale, just like you package your product for sale. So find the right buyer, qualify the buyer, understand why they wanna buy it, what they're gonna value in it, right? What are the things they really care about? For instance, any given day, any given company, one buyer might be interested in buying that company for its customers. Basically, they have product, they want more market, right? So you got 100,000 customers, they want those customers so they can sell their product to your customers, right? Makes sense? Mm -hmm. And maybe they're gonna value you, let's say, nine times earnings, something like that. Another company, wants to buy you for, let's say, your intellectual property. You have know, a method, you have some technology, a patent, a trademark, a copyright, something. They want that, right? In other words, they have plenty of market, they want more product. They want your product to sell to their customers, you see? And let's say they're gonna pay 12 times, right? Now on the surface, I had $100,000, if you were in that situation, I had $100,000 and I was gonna give it to you, where would you put it? Where would you invest that $100,000? Well, I'd try, try to get the higher multiple. Yeah, yeah. you put it in intellectual property yeah. because that $100,000 is worth 1.2 million, right? In that one, it's only worth 900,000 in the other one, mm -hmm. right? That makes sense, right? Except if doing that one costs you a lot more. Right. Than doing the other, right? So those are the things that you have to recognize. You have to sort of design that and recognize that, well, I need to know who's interested in buying me and why. Right now, you can find this out yourself. It's just so much easier to use an external agent who can go do the research anonymously and give you the real perspective, give you the real outside view of where you are. And that's why companies like ours exist, mm -hmm. because we can do that find out what you're worth, both from a market standpoint, i.e. the buy side, also from the sales side. What can it be worth, right? So each of the stories I've shared with you shares both of those. It's what was it worth when we started, what did we turn it into, right? Because we were selling the company, not helping it get bought. Do you mind if I take some questions? No. Yeah, hey, any questions out there, Steve? Yeah, go ahead, I'll start with you, Brian. Yeah. Maybe other people on that team sort of in a consensus made that decision, but I wondered if there was a certain pattern or a certain thing that developed where it was now not 12 months from now or 24 months from now. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was day one, always day one. And that's the advice I would give a business owner today. Someone came to me today, actually somebody this past week came to me and said, I want to start a business, what's the first thing I do? My answer is develop an exit strategy. And people sort of look at you funny, you're like, what, I need to tell you. Right, that's the point, right? Because really what you want to do, and this is a simple fact of the matter, the best possible scenario for the founder of a company, now this is, you know, not its employees, not the rest of the planet, you know, I'm not trying to incorporate the whole story, but the best of all possible things for the founder is to get in and get out in less than 26 months. Hmm. In the 26 months, you come up with, like, why not 20 or 30? Just the numbers. I mean, if you just look at the averages. So um, in the last five years, um, average uh, transaction volume for uh, small to medium-sized companies has been between 35 million and 42 million in acquisition price. It's not a lot of money. The difference is that it's non-diluted capital. So yeah, you run out 12 years, now you're gonna sell for 300 million, but you're still gonna get your 20 million. Right. <laughs> you were just giving up 12 years of your life. So basically, by shortening the window, you're not diluting your company, you're just running it through. Now, uh, so if you just look at the averages, the optimum time is between 22 and 28 months, as it turns out. Hmm. How does that impact your ability from day one to 
say, say day one, they launch, if you will, in 20, 26 months to build up a adequate EBITDA to have that multiple being. Well, you're assuming that the multiple is based on EBITDA. You send me the check later. What are the characteristics you look for in a business that might be worth yeah. hiring you? So um, there's, there aren't any that we you know, can't do. There's a bunch that we don't like doing. Like we, we don't like doing law firms and doctor's offices and you know, medical practices, dentists. You know, those, it's just not very interesting to us. <laughs> I hate going into those places. No, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, so services, we, we have done some recruiting firms. Anybody uh, remember Don Richard's associate? Yeah. Right? Uh, so, so Richard is a good friend of mine. Now, what was interesting about that is we didn't sell the business. We worked out an entirely different strategy. And it's ended up, they've made almost two and a half times what they would have made had we sold it. What we did is probably akin to what you helped people. Is, um, we help them understand that in a business like that, um, the, the transaction itself has all kinds of rough edges because it's you know there's so much tied up in the personalities of the business, um, and that it's very difficult to create a clean extraction. Mm -hmm. um, where so instead of doing that, you didn't have you know, have all the branding problems. Right? What we did is we just brought up two guys on the inside. Uh, we negotiated. In effect, an ESOP, you know, a very small ESOP program. The two founders, in effect, retired to their homes in Naples or wherever it is. They both get, they got uh, perpetual royalties on a percentage basis. And last time I checked, it's been in north of $2 million a piece for almost 15 years. It's not bad. So, you know, so it's, yeah. you know, they would never have walked away that much money that they sold. Right. Yeah. But, yeah. But what about uh, geographically or size of business or uh, other, other yeah. aspects? Geographic, we're okay. Uh, we go pretty much everywhere. The trucking company is in California. Uh, we sold a, uh, yeah. Anybody see the new cars where you get in the car and it inherits the uh, features of your phone? Yeah. Right, that's mm -hmm. the technology we sold. The company was headquartered in Utah. We sold that, we sold that twice. Sold it once for 14 million, and then three months later we sold it again for 46 million. Pretty good. Pretty nice. <laughs> so anyway, really, um, I, to be fair, our backgrounds tend to be tech companies, but as you've heard some of the stories I've said uh, described, we don't really have to stick there. Um, Size-wise, um, we can do an exit strategy assessment for pretty much anybody. That's um, that, just so you get a sense of it, is a six-week deep dive on the company. You know, we jump in and, you know, get immersed in the company. And our objective is, within six weeks, to identify the three highest valuation exit trajectories that are available to the company, identify what the company is worth now, what it will be worth at the end on any one of those three, and exactly what the company is going to need to do to get to those three. Right, that's a fixed price engagement. Yeah, how much does free cash flow factor into you know, your projected valuation? Um, it depends on the market and the particular segment. Uh, so the way we do our valuations, I don't actually do them. I haven't done them from the outside because there's a credibility component there. Um, but the fellow that we use uses a sort of a, an industry average component, and he has three other techniques that he wants. One of them is heavily weighted. Depending on the industry, it might just lay it out. But there's certain industries where it's very valuable. Uh, for instance, uh, if it's a real e-commerce play, you know, real high consulting play. What's a, what is a bigger driver for a consulting play? Well, consulting is hard. Um, you know, it's just so much of it is brand, but if you're really good at building process, mm -hmm. 
And, um, you know, a lot of people don't know that a trademark carries almost as much value juice as a patent. Mm. So if you can come up with um, a methodology that you can trademark, right, that's, that's pretty valuable. Sure. Right? And that can drive value pretty effectively. Come up with a whole methodology, sort of a whole approach. And if you think about it, these are what these right. guys do. Exactly. That's why I bought it. I, I didn't have to design the IP myself, right? I bought the IP. It's all reason why I bought it. Um, any other questions out there? Yeah. Just curious, your time horizon for your company. Like, are you thinking, like, okay, I'm going to pop this thing after 22 to 28 yeah. months, or do you think that you're having so much fun? Why do it? Because I've done that in the past. No. So I don't do anything <laughs> for fun like that. <laughs> I don't work for fun. Well. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so my exit strategy is a little bit unique um, in that um, our value drivers are all in the back end of our business. So um, while we get paid for consulting and fees and all that kind of stuff, the real value of our business is in the equity portfolio that we develop. So um, every we won't work on a project without equity. No point in it. Because that's our play. Um, so if you think about it, we do... 20 companies a year, at the end of five years, we've got an equity stake in 100 companies. That's a billion dollar asset, roughly. Right? I think we can do well with that. Right? And that just becomes a leverageable asset that we can use going forward. That, at that juncture, I think that'd be pretty much done. So it's not how they will sell it, in other words. We just have the asset. Yeah. So, and how much oh. you sold it to a private equity fund or somebody who might want that? Yeah, but why would you? You got, a, you, got a, you got an annuity for life. I don't know. Exactly. Um, you might sell off chunks of it, right, if you wanted to. I don't know. So you got a billion dollar asset going off, uh, yeah. I don't know, whatever. That's my view. Uh, I mean, things could change. It's a different strategy. Alan. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that's fascinating is not only what you're doing now, but going back to uh, being a 13 year old. Yeah. Going, uh, yeah. Some of us are more worried about uh, career sales and, <laughs> and the opposite of sex and starting a sexy business. So I'm just wondering what would you say, and, and this has been consistent with you, pretty amazing. Some of the most successful people we all know about, like Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, woman in California named Elizabeth Holmes who has a company called Theranos, which is a $9 billion company. College dropouts, you, you went back. What would you say if we had teenage kids or others were advising young people, what would you say are some of the elements that can lead to entrepreneurial success based on your example? You know, it's really interesting you asked that question. Good question. Um, and I, I didn't have any insight to an answer until recently. Um, I, I can't explain the 13-year-old thing. I and mean, I look at my, my daughter's 16, I look at her boyfriends and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> no one ever had that. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't know. I can't explain it. You know, that's just not where I was, I guess. <laughs> but even for ourselves, I mean, uh, you, you, it sounds like one of the elements, that, which I'd say is in a book called Innovate Like Edison by yeah. a woman named Michael Gelb, yeah. is a lo looking for issues and having a sort of solution minded. Uh, that's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. And I think that's something that you can uh, you can teach or at least uh, maybe influence, encourage, or observe, yeah. encourage. Yeah. Better word. Um, I mean, I, we were walking. We were in Chicago for a weekend not long ago, and we were walking along, and I saw a problem, and I asked my daughter. I said, well, "What would you do about that problem right there?" When she got done looking at me like <laughs> a question like that. <laughs> worry about the guy over there. <laughs> um, anyway, so we had a long talk about that. It was a bike rack thing. Yeah. So it's sort of a yes, fun yes, problem. Yeah, I was just in Chicago last week. I, I think they had another problem. They got a big they problem did. with bikes. Yeah, they did. They did. <laughs> uh, you know, and so we just uh, sat there for a while and innovated some ideas. And we were walking along afterwards. She goes, so are we going to do anything with that? I said, I don't know. Do you want to? And I'm not going to do it. Do you want to do it? <laughs> you know, so I think you could do that. That's probably a good thing to do, get people thinking in terms of right. seeing problems that exist and helping them understand that, you know, the way stuff happens in the world is that people step out and do something about problems, right? I think a lot of times we just think that somebody else is going to take care of the problem. 
right? And of course, those are the ones where we go, dang, I had that idea. Right. Five years ago, I could have done that, right? But you didn't, right? So, you know, it's that kind of thing. So first mover, so get people thinking that, I know that's good. Um, with regard to education, you know, I have to tell you, I'm an advocate for college. I didn't do it well, <laughs> um, but I am an advocate for it. Um, I think what's wrong with the educational system, though, uh, it has to do with one of the projects that I'm heavily invested in right now, is that um, we do it wrong here. We, we are so focused and we focus our kids so much on getting in that we never stop and ask the important question. You know, it is less important in terms of success, in my opinion, and I think the numerics and the statistics back up. It's less important for you to get in to a top grade university, a possible exception being at, for professional practices, like lawyers and surgeons right. and that kind of thing. I, I accept that's a reality. But for the general person, than it is to find the university or college environment in which you will thrive. So if you could go to a local community college and thrive there, you're better off doing that than going to Yale or wherever. I mean, I don't like Harvard, so I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, because I think that, what, but what we, what we socialize our kids into, and the real tragedy is parents my age. I look at all my daughter's parents' friends, and we're friends of ours now, of course, and it's like they're all freaked out about getting in. Right. It's like, look, there's 2,800 colleges in this country. They, they can get in. The fact is that 99.9% .9 of all students who want to get into a college can get into a college. Are they all going to get into Yale or Purdue or Dartmouth? No, but probably they don't belong there. And that's the key. So it's really about investing, in my opinion, in getting to the right place. Now, I reflect on my I'm situation. Got, we got about one minute left. And yeah. I think that's what was wrong. So when I quit school, I mean, I hated school the day I got there. Right? I mean, that's, <laughs> my roommate walked in. I was like, oh, I'm going to hate this. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Right? And so I went from there down. <laughs> right? uh, and when I went back, you know, I was, I was I had nothing to do with the school at that point. I was, you know, years older, lived in my apartment off campus. You know, they were all little kids. Right. So, totally different. So. All right, Steve. Any last pieces of wisdom for the group before I just, before I get us off the stage here? No. Um, I think that uh, you know it's really I just try to stay focused on knowing what's driving value in your business. And if you don't know it, get someone to come in and help you figure it out. It's really easy. You know, I mean, when I look at all those companies, that was, that's the formula. It's always been the same. Now, for me, as I mentioned, I started day one. Right? That's what I perceived that to be my job, get the company into an exit. Um, yeah. All right. Thanks, Stephen. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.